the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There are two things that God is concerned about with you and me. Your sin and your salvation. Your sin, which hurts both yourself and others, which separates us from God, which robs us of the life that God would have for us, both life now and life forever. And God is concerned for your salvation, which is God dealing with the issue of sin, healing the damage inflicted by sin, which includes dealing with death, bringing you and I back together with himself, restoring us to life, a full and meaningful life. A life that will last forever. There are two things that Satan is concerned with also. Your sin and your salvation. Your sin which he wants to keep you in so that you continue to hurt others, continue to be separated from God, and continue to rob you of your life. Though he would have us believe that our sin actually gives us a better life. Satan is also concerned about your salvation, which he wants to keep you far away from, to keep God far away from you and convince you that even if you do care about these things, you can do it by yourself. You can undo the damage of sin and death and fix it yourself. But Satan's problem is that while he can keep you away from God with his lies and temptations, he can't keep God away from you. So God comes to us in this world of sin and death. And in many and various ways, depending on the situation, depending on what is needed, he came to Adam and Eve terrified by their sin, hiding from God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, God finds them and calls out to them. He came to Moses in a wonderful way, in a bush that burned with fire but was not consumed. He came to the prophet Elijah in a still, small, quiet voice. And today we heard he came in two different ways. First of all, on Mount Sinai, in such a fearsome display of power and might that not only the people, but the mountain itself trembled greatly. And then secondly, he comes into Jerusalem in the exact opposite way. Humbly, lowly, to the cheers and welcome of the children, leading some to wonder, Will the true God stand up? This is not two different gods, but one God with one goal. To deal with your sin and to give you salvation. So when he comes down on Mount Sinai, he does both. He gives the law and he gives the instructions for the building of the tabernacle, the priesthood, and all of the sacrifices that were to be offered in that temple for the forgiveness of their sins to give them his holiness. Or to put that in good Lutheran terminology, there is both law and there is gospel. God dealing with sin and God giving forgiveness and salvation. And so Moses tells the people at Sinai, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. Do not fear. God is coming to save. But it sounds a little bit odd, doesn't it? What Moses said there. Do not fear that the fear of him may be before you. So which is it? To fear or not to fear? How do we approach a holy God like that? The people of Jerusalem that we heard about were not cowering in fear Or if they were, it was not because of Jesus, but because of the Romans. Unlike the people at Mount Sinai, when God comes to them, when their king comes to them, they take out palm branches and lay their cloaks down 
and welcome him with rejoicing. They call out Hosanna, which means save us. They welcome him with the words, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But not many days later, they too were trembling. For the one who came to save them was hanging derelict on a cross. He was rejected, abused, mocked, cursed, hung between two criminals, one who was considered worse to have around than Barabbas, and then he was dead. Now what? They went home, fearing for their lives. Who would save them now? Well, it is the prophet Isaiah who brings this all together for us tonight, a bridge or sorts from Mount Sinai to Jerusalem. Isaiah is sometimes called the fifth evangelist because his prophecy is so filled with Jesus, prophecies of who he was and what he would do. And in his vision tonight, in the verses that we heard, there is trembling and fear, but there is also thanksgiving and salvation. First, as a filthy, wretched sinner, Isaiah stands in the presence of a holy God. He is filled with trembling and woe like the people of Mount Sinai, and rightly so. Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of unclean people. But when a coal from the altar touches his lips, his guilt is taken away, his sin is atoned for, and he is a new man. And as such, he is filled with thanksgiving. He is able to stand before God and is ready to live a new life that he received, the life God intended him to have always. Isaiah knew his sin, and his lips were touched with that salvation. He both feared and loved God feared him as, as a sinner, and loved him as a sinner made a saint, which really is our reality. Luther's small catechism teaches the commandments. It includes the explanation of each one. We should fear and love God so that we fear him as sinners. We fear him for breaking these commandments. And we love him as a sinner made saint and so gladly do what he commands. We should fear and love God. Mount Sinai and Jerusalem together. Isaiah before and after. Which is also the reality of that cross. For that cross shows us the seriousness of our sin and the end result of our sin, which is death. And we tremble like the people at Mount Sinai and like Isaiah in the throne room of God. But upon the cross, we also see the forgiveness of our sins, so that we rejoice and give thanks like the people of Jerusalem and like Isaiah after that coal touched his lips, because on that fearsome cross is not us, but Jesus, Jesus in our place, Jesus atoning for our sins, the sins of the entire world. And this truth has now put, been put into the holy liturgy for us, which we call the Sanctus, the fourth ordinary, the fourth part of the liturgy that is in every service for us to sing. For the Sanctus has two parts. First is the song of the angels in the presence of God that Isaiah heard in the throne room of heaven, which brought him to his knees, flat on his face, trembling in fear. But also the second part, the song of the people of Jerusalem in welcoming their Savior. Here, like Isaiah, we are in the presence of the Holy God. And so we rightly fear his wrath against sin, and we repent. But we also love the one who comes and now touches our lips with the sacrifice of the altar, with his very body and blood. And with that, our guilt is taken away, our sin is atoned for, and as God then sent Isaiah, a sinner made saint, out to be a, his prophet, so he now sends us out from this place into the places that he has put us. We should fear and love God. Law and gospel. Sin and salvation. But of the two, the greatest of these is love. The Lord's salvation is greater than your sin. The love of God is more than the fear of him. For while on the cross shows us both, it is his love that shines most brightly to make you his son and his daughter. 
and that is what you are. There are two things that God is concerned with, your sin and your salvation. So on the cross, he takes your sin and he gives you his salvation, salvation that is given to us frightening and trembled sinners that we might rejoice in him. Take and eat, take and drink, he says. Your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. What else is there to say? But blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith to Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.